So, you guys just getting to know me, I went to seminary and Bible college. Um, it was a great experience. I would never trade it. However, obviously we go to college for a purpose, and my reason was to train for the ministry. And that required teaching and a lot of work. See, I had all kinds of classes and professors, some long days, some short days. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, it was very difficult sometimes to pay attention in the classes that I got. Um, you get the classic, like the whole nodding off while you're going or the person next to you on their phone or their laptop playing a game, you're just thinking, ugh. And it sucks because you pay so much money to go to this place and yet sometimes you still can't pay attention. It's hard to focus. Some professors, some professors were kind of more mean, would like wake you up, pay attention. Others would be a little bit kinder, like, okay guys, let's quiet down. But because the cost and because of the purpose that I went to this seminary, it made those times losing focus like that much more like unenjoyable and difficult. Like I wish I didn't. But it's not just in a classroom setting that we tend to lose focus, that we can't pay attention to well. Um, things that we want to pay attention to. Yeah, school's important, but what about paying attention to a child who's just learned to walk? There have been many a horror story when you don't pay attention there. Even more seriously, we must be paying attention or what happens when somebody's not paying attention while they're driving because they've got their phone right up in front of them. These are important situations. But an even more serious matter is when we should be paying attention to the Bible and what it says to us. Because whether we pay attention to this or not, won't just determine about our lives here, but our destination after as well. And we're going to see what we need to pay attention to in our passage today, which is Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. And just a quick thing before we read, um, pay attention to or focus on that Hebrews is going to tell us to pay much closer attention to what we believe in. So let's go ahead and read the first four verses together. It begins, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift, drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his wealth. Pay close attention to what you believe. That's the idea I'm going to grab onto and hold. And we're going to see that we must pay closer attention because of what, or pay attention to what you believe because what we believe has been proven true and what we believe has been proclaimed by really important people, voices, God. So pay attention to what you believe. And we're just going to look at what it means to pay attention. That's the first verse here we see in chapter 2. And just kind of getting ourselves more familiar with that idea. I'm sure we've all been told, and I'm sure we've all told many people, these exact words. Pay attention. Pay attention. As someone who teaches the Bible to middle schoolers and high schoolers regularly, I have to use this phrase, pay attention quite a bit. Whether it's for the boy nodding off in the corner, the girls giggling over there, Pay attention. What I have to say is important. But attention 
will always be hard to, a hard thing to get from all people, not just students. And it's even harder to keep. There are all kinds of tricks people use to try and keep people's attention. I mean, this whole class gives us many ideas about how to use words wisely so that we can keep these people's attention and influence them. And as fellow leaders, I'm sure you have struggled with getting the attentions of others many times. And I wish that I could say that people pay attention to the important stuff. Like I wish that I could tell you that they will always listen to you when you're telling them the most important thing. That's obviously not true. I mean, the author of Hebrews here is clearly trying to get these people to listen to this. But why does he want them to pay attention? What is he trying to get them to pay attention to? Well, that is given to us by the context more clearly. In chapter 1, we get a testimony of Jesus. He is the heir of all things, the Son of God, the one who God speaks through now. And we have the testimony of God and the scriptures about who Jesus is and his authority as ruler and king. But after this passage, we have the reason why Jesus has all the authority and power. It's not just that he is God. But it's also because he is resurrected king. He has defeated sin, he has defeated death, and they are now subjected under him. This, my friends, is the gospel. And that is what the author is calling us to pay more attention to. The fact that Jesus is reigning in heaven right now as we speak. He has all authority, power, because of his life, death, and resurrection. This is why this passage is calling us to pay closer attention to it, because of how important this message is. And I know, I know, we're all leaders here. We've heard the gospel a million times in our lives. You know the gospel like the back of your hand. Well, Maybe that's actually the reason why it's the first thing you turn tune out. Why is it that when people start talking about the gospel, we think, I know this, I get it, I don't really need to listen to the rest. Why is it that the gospel can be sometimes the hardest thing for us to pay attention to? That's a hard question to answer. And I think there are plenty of decent answers. But I think one of the biggest reasons is because we get lax. We lose focus. We drift slowly away, as we see in this passage, from that. Which is why Hebrews is calling us. Pay attention. But it's not just knowing the gospel that we have to pay attention to. It's also living these gospel truths out. Those who drift away from the truths of the gospel are not those who don't know the gospel in their heads. They are the ones who live out their lives in ways that are slight twists of the gospel truths. People who think that God is completely sovereign might think that they don't have any responsibility of the actions in their lives then. I can live however I want. Once saved, always saved. Or, you know, God is so loving, so kind and merciful and forgiving. So much so that he will always forgive me, no matter what I do. Two opposite ends of the spectrum, both come into a similar conclusion. It is when we teach the truths, or twist these truths, that we are in danger of falling away from them. And this doesn't necessarily happen overnight. It can be a slow and long process over years and years and years. If you have been keeping up with the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast, we see that this didn't explode 
Marcel didn't crumble in a year. Mark had a good dream when he started, but that went sideways because he wasn't paying close attention to the gospel truths, what he believed in. And this twisting doesn't have to be by much. I read a story about two experienced pilots who were flying a passenger jet of around 250 people from New Zealand to Antarctica. They were going to show off some of the landscape and the, really the beautiful landscape of Antarctica to these people. And they pay for it. It's like a big thing. But when they began they fl their flight, the pilots didn't realize that they were two degrees off. That's like smaller than that. Two degrees. And that caused them to drift so far away from their goal that when they descended below the clouds, they ended up crashing into a volcano that resulted in the deaths of all the people on board. Two degrees was all it took for this flight to crash. See, they weren't paying attention. And ultimately, that resulted in their death. And once again, when we don't pay much closer attention to the things we believe, the gospel, and how to live that out, then we won't just die this physical death, but we'll die that spiritual one as well. We see this clearly in verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3. We see that the gospel is proven true, but how is it proven true? You see, the message the angels give is a message given to us. And just a lot of debate about what the message is, like it could be Jesus, um, his birth, maybe. Um, it could also be kind of a reference to the Old Testament and the commandments that God gave to them. And I think that fits better because of this second part, where it says, every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. So, they're referring to whether you do righteousness or whether you are sinful. And what happens when you are sinful? You have a just retribution. Through Jesus and his resurrection, that truth is justified. Like, how can you believe that the angel's message is about the law and righteousness? We need that. Or, or do, if I'm sinful, do I really need to pursue righteousness? Will that really come under judgment? Jesus' death and resurrection proves those things true. Because Jesus has died and was raised again, we know that there is sin that needed to be paid for and that we need a righteousness to live. So, if we do not pay, co pay closer attention to our lives, then we will not be counted among those who are righteous with Jesus, and instead, we will be judged by Him. See, the beginning of verse 3 shows us that we cannot escape if we neglect the salvation that we have been given in Jesus. This verse and a half proves what we have heard to be true. And that's why we must pay attention because the results are huge. I mean, we are so easily moved to neglect the gospel and its realities. Our lives should be striving after the renewed life we have in Christ. He gives us his righteousness. He justifies us before God. And because of that, we should want to live as the righteous ones we are in Christ. And what that looks like here is not giving up or taking breaks from the gospel, but being vigilant in our life to make every effort to remain in Him and pursue Him in righteousness. 
I don't know about you, but I am 90% sure that if I went and got tested for ADD, then I would probably be told I got it. It's hard for me to sit down and do something for long periods of time without getting distracted pretty easily. It's hard for me to pay attention to sermon, speeches, read through certain nonfiction books. But does that mean I should just quit because it's hard? Absolutely not. These things are good for me and I must try hard to pay attention and do these things. That might look like instead of just listening to a sermon, I have a pen and paper near me to take notes. Maybe even coming up with a method of note taking that will benefit me in trying to pay closer attention. Coming up with a schedule that helps me to slowly move through a book and complete it instead of just leaving it on the shelf. Or even having people keep me accountable and keeping me in check during my office hours to make sure I'm getting a good amount of work done, all the work that I need. And the same is true for following Jesus. Paying attention to our lives, asking the hard questions like, where do I need to pay attention more to the gospel? Where am I living for others instead of myself? Am I truly dying to myself? It's hard, but that doesn't mean I should stop trying. In fact, it means I have to be creative and faithful to come up with ways that help me not just to pay attention, but to pay even closer attention to what it is that I am doing and why it is I am doing it. We have to pay even closer attention because the consequences of drifting away are eternal. Judgment is sure. The gospel and its results are proven true, so pay attention. And if you thought that wasn't enough of a reason, we see that we should pay attention because of the second thing. The ones who proclaim the truths of the gospel. The things that we have heard. The ones who proclaim it to the church of the Hebrews was written, and really is written for all of us, and it's threefold. First, we have Jesus, Lord, it says in verse 3, declared first by the Lord. As we've seen in this book, um, which is all about Jesus, as he is reigning and all-powerful, he is the King of kings, the Son of God, the one who will rule forever and ever. Nothing can stand against him, and nothing will. He has crushed his enemies, and no physical or spiritual authority will ever come close to his power. This is the one who proclaims the truths to us and he has given it to us and if this all-powerful one tells you to believe in him then I would venture to say that you probably should because if you don't as we have seen you'll be judged for your sins justly but more importantly because of the benefits you receive for listening to him. You get salvation from God's wrath and get to share in his authority and his blessing as we too shall become greater than the angels. Jesus proclaims it. We should then pay even closer attention to it. But there is also those who proclaim it to us after Jesus. I mean the Christians that have come before you. It is by their faithful testimony and you have heard it from them and it is by their struggles that you might be here sitting and believing. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a message of salvation, and for Jesus, it was costly. And it's free for those who believe in him, but it's costly to go and share it as well. Suffering comes to those who follow Jesus because he suffered. The people who come before were faithful, and they were faithful to tell more and more. And it is by their testimony in their lives that we are sitting here right now. So let us not tarnish their reputations. Let's not make their work or their labor vain, but let us pay closer attention to our lives and the message we have heard. Let us make it something we believe and lived out. And then we see here lastly at the end of or the, verse four, the last one to proclaim the truth is God the Father. This one is so interesting because he doesn't proclaim it by words, but by power. 
And as we have seen, interestingly, God's words are power. So that's a whole other thing. But it says that he has performed signs and wonders and miracles. And these signs, they testify that Jesus is who he said he is. And God works through these things to proclaim through the gifts of the Spirit as well. And if you know about the gifts of the Spirit, then you know that they are distributed to His people. So God proclaims the gospel by these miraculous signs, but He also does it through the spiritual gifts in His people. So, with all this power and these gifts, God's will is being worked out. It's all according to His will. And what His will is, is for His people to not drift away from the message that they have heard, but to pay much closer attention to what He has said and given. So, pay closer attention. Where can you grow? Where can you see that you have not been paying attention? Because we must, otherwise we will drift away. Pay attention because truths of the gospel and the results were proven true by Jesus and because of the great ones that proclaim it to us.